Welcome and good morning. It's great to be able to connect with you on this second Sunday of 2021. And I hope you're doing well, staying healthy, um, and uh, just enjoying this California winter. The Santa Anas are picking up, so uh, enjoy that too if you're able. A uh, couple of announcements before we begin our service. I just want to remind you to be in prayer for all of those who are uh, dealing with COVID, whether they have the virus and are ill, or whether they are part of the first responders or medical personnel that are fighting it. You know, it is, uh, from what I've heard from people who are working in hospitals, it's pretty traumatic when uh, you have an ICU and it's full of folks that can't breathe and are, uh, are struggling. So pray for them. Pray that they be encouraged and that, uh, that God would be with them and help them to really minister grace to, to those who are suffering. Also, I want to just encourage you to uh, be thinking about praying for our church family as we're kind of bifurcated or, or cut in two. We have some who are comfortable coming and worshiping in person with masks and social distancing and others who for uh, several and very good reasons are not doing so and are participating in the church life through this medium and, and others. But pray that God would give us a real spirit of unity and, uh, and joy as we Think about how this is a challenging year, even 2021, and how we can navigate our way through it and uh, reach out to each other, call each other. Uh, if you come to the regular services with the masks and the social distancing, call folks who aren't on the phone and just keep those connections alive so that we don't see each other six months from now or whenever things finally get back to normal and have to reintroduce ourselves. Uh, I also want to just encourage all of us to be praying for our nation. Needless to say, we are in very strange uh, times and in some respects uncharted territory, at least in recent history. And uh, just want to encourage, I'm not going to preach on that. Uh, I'm going to stick with the gospel and the scriptures that I believe God's called me to preach through. But I do want to encourage and exhort you to be in prayer for our country. And lastly, just a reminder that we do, for those of you who are, for whom it's uh, safe or wise to carefully with a mask uh, come out uh, to worship, we do meet at 1030. And if you could come by 10 o'clock so you can get your temperature taken, respond to a questionnaire. Um, we have a, uh, I don't know if a vetting process is the right term, but it's a, a registration process that is uh recommended by the CDC and uh, and others so it's we're, we're trying as hard as we can to be as safe as as possible and uh, and have some public worship well and again that's at 10:30 if you have any questions call the church office we'd uh, love to hear from you this morning our call to worship is from Psalm 19 it's the first four verses please join me in uh, listening to God's word as I read them the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are reminded that you are constantly revealing yourself through creation and that the heavens declare your glory and that the sky above proclaims your handiwork. Lord, that day by day, night by night, everywhere that human speech or any speech can be heard, Lord, so is the voice proclaiming your glory, your greatness, that you are creator, maker, that you are the author, that you are the sovereign over all. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be mindful of the fact that we come to you as the God who has revealed himself, not just through creation, but especially through the prophets, Lord, through the apostles, through Christ. You've given us your word, the scriptures, which are for us, Lord, such a safe surety, such a guaranteed source of truth and life and guidance. Lord, as we come to worship you, we do uh, ask that you be with us and bless us, and we ask that you would continue your great work of speaking to us, calling us into your presence, uh, ministering your gospel to us, uh, compelling us, urging us uh, to lay hold of Christ, and comforting us with those words of hope and assurance that 
you are a God who forgives and loves to the uttermost. Father, be with us as we worship you this Sunday, and, uh, and bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. In your Bibles today, I'd like to invite you to turn with me to the book of Job, chapter 33. Last week, we looked at the book of Job. Beginning in chapter 32, we noted that we have an introduction to a new character in the book of Job, a man by the name of Elihu, and he's a young man. And he's a man who's really angry because he has heard God's reputation sullied. Things have been said about God that put God in a, a very poor light, as if God isn't really aware of who's doing right and who's doing wrong, or if God is somehow being unfair in levying uh, judgment in the form of suffering against Job. And Elihu is very pedantically, to put it as nicely as possible, with many words and very repetitively, drawing attention to the fact that he's really upset Job, and he's, his anger burns because Job said about God. It's a, it's a, it's a, and you're right. And for Elihu, God is always in the right. And his friends should have come up with an answer. So last week we looked at that two-part introduction. The narrator introduced uh, Elihu as a, a young man who's very passionate about defending the honor and integrity of God. And then we looked at how Job is very sensitive to the fact that by rights he shouldn't be speaking. He's young, and he goes, bends over backwards and uh, spends, we might think, way too much time defending, if you will, his right to speak. And he says, you know, I'm uh, I'm full of words, like a wineskin ready to burst, and the spirit within is prompting me. And, you know, God gives wisdom, not just gray hair, and previous speakers have failed, so let me share my opinion also. So after this long introduction, Elihu begins with the first of four speeches. And this speech uh, is the entirety of Job chapter 33. So this morning, we're going to look at Job chapter 33, and consider Elihu's first speech. Please join me in prayer before I read this passage of Scripture for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It is a uh, lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It is, um, Lord, a, a sanctifying uh, force in our life as you, by your Spirit, apply it to us. Uh, Lord, it is a source of instruction. It is a comfort. Lord, sometimes it, it rebukes us and calls us to repentance. Lord, it is, it is your very voice speaking through these uh, words of Scripture, in these words of Scripture, Lord, uh, to every part of our condition that matters. And Father, we pray that we would be overwhelmed with a sense of awe at the fact that you have raised, you have exalted your word above all things but your name. Lord, how precious and important is the truth that you are the speaking God and that in Scripture you have spoken. Lord, as this part of Scripture is read, I ask that you would bless us. Make us mindful of the incredible privilege it is to have it. And Lord, make us uh, that much better able to understand this chapter and how we might apply it to our lives, that we can live for your glory and our neighbor's good. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Job chapter 33, the word of God. But now hear my speech, O Job, and listen to all my words. Behold, I open my mouth, the tongue in my mouth speaks. My words declare the uprightness of my heart, and what my lips know, they speak sincerely. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Answer me if you can. Set your words in order before me. Take your stand. Behold, I am toward God as you are. I, too, was pinched off from a piece of clay. Behold, no fear of me need terrify you. My pressure will not be heavy upon you. Surely you have spoken in my ears, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, I am pure, without transgression. I am clean, and there is no iniquity in me. Behold, he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches all my paths. Behold, in this you are not right. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend against him, saying, He will answer none of man's words? 
For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men while they slumber on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings, that he may turn man aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. Man is also rebuked with pain on his bed and with continual strife in his bones, so that his life loathes bread and his appetite the choicest food. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. His soul draws near to the pit and his life to those who bring death. If there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand, to declare to man what is right for him, and he is merciful to him and says, Deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then man prays to God and he accepts him. He sees his face with a shout of joy and he restores to man his righteousness. He sings before men and says, I sinned and perverted what was right and it was not repaid to me. He has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit and my life shall look upon the light. Behold, God does all these things twice, three times with a man to bring back his soul from the pit that he may be lighted with the light of life. Pay attention, O Job, listen to me. Be silent and I will speak. If you have any words, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Be silent and I will teach you wisdom. This ends the reading of God's word. Like all of these four speeches of Elihu and like the introduction of Elihu, you could get uh, 15 different uh, books or commentaries or studies on the person of Elihu as he occurs in the book of Job. And seven of them will say, Elihu's a terrible guy. Seven will say, Elihu's a great guy. And one of them will say, I don't know. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing to analyze the role of Elihu, partly because he's separated from us by 3,000 some years. And partly because his culture is separated us from 3, 000, by 3,000 years. You know, sometimes when we see Baroque architecture, we find it to be ugly because there's too much going on. Baroque architecture was eloquent. There was all kinds of stuff going on, all kinds of ornate uh, patterns built into everything. It was nothing simple about it. Some of the, the kind of basic geometry was pleasing to the eye, but it was incredibly complex, busy. And some people look at that and think, boy, I'd never build a building like that. In fact, we don't typically use Baroque architecture today. And I think when many of us look back at the speeches of Elihu, we look at the fact that his words are described by scholars as being uh, prolix. There are so many of them, and there's big words, and he's kind of highfalutin, and he's repetitive. And in a word, he's kind of Baroque. He seems a little bit much. But I would urge us to consider that that is not a reason to come to a conclusion that Elihu should sort of be held at arm's length because he didn't know how to say anything the way John Calvin would have liked to say it. Remember, John Calvin's uh, great buzzwords were uh, claritas and brevitas, clear and brief. That's how he wanted everything to be, clear and brief. Uh, well, Eliphaz wanted things to be clear, but he didn't really, pardon me, Elihu wanted things to be clear, but never wanted anything to be brief. Stretches things out with word pictures, says things two, three times, but let's not judge him too harshly on that. Let's look at the content of what he says. Now, when we look at this first speech, it breaks into three parts. An assurance, where Elihu's basically saying, Job, I'm going to share with you what I believe God has laid on my heart to say, and no more, no less, and I'm just like you, don't fear me. Just like you were pinched off from the clay, a kind of an echo of Genesis chapter uh, 2, where from the dust of the earth God forms man, uh, are you saying, I too was formed by God. I too bear, I'm towards him the same way you are. I am a creature of the Almighty. The second thing he says is, Job, I've, I've heard what you've said. And you've said these three things about God. 
And the fourth thing he says, uh, pardon me, and the third thing he says is, Job, you are not right to say these things. In particular, you are not right to conclude based upon your observations that God has not, does not, or is not speaking. Now, to back up with them and look at this, I, in thinking about Elihu, Elihu is a vague figure in some ways. You know, the Bible comes out with neither a clear condemnation or a clear affirmation of this young man, Elihu. But Elihu is utterly distinct from Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, the other advisors to Job, for at least two reasons. One is fairly explicit, that when God rebukes the friends, he deliberately and explicitly does not mention Elihu. God neither condemns nor blesses Elihu's words explicitly. Uh, but the other thing is that when we look at what Elihu says, Elihu says, I'm not going to use their arguments against you, Job. He says that in his introduction. And that rings absolute, absolutely rock-solidly true. Because Elihu does not, in fact, rehash the same talking points that the other three do. And what's more, uh, Elihu doesn't resort to the kind of ad hominem uh, or you know, directed to the man sort of caustic, sarcastic, personal attacks that the other three all to varying degrees descend to. And that's something that is observed too infrequently about Elihu. Elihu has a laser-like focus on Job, I've heard you say these things. And all three of these things that he quotes Job saying are paraphrases of things Job has said and things that have been attributed to Job by the other speakers. He's summarizing Job's broader argument. We'll get to that in a minute. And then he is dealing with Job's words that Job himself uttered during his suffering. Elihu is not for a second entertaining any imagination about what Job might have done or said before he began to suffer. You see, Job isn't interested in trying to, Elihu is not interested in trying to come up with some rationale for why it is that Job is being punished. That's not on, Job, uh, on Elihu's agenda at all. Elihu's agenda is simply to say, Job, in your suffering, you have said things about God that are not right. And things that you need to turn from. Now, what are those things? Verse 8, Surely you have spoken in my ears, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, I am pure without transgression. I am clean, and there is no iniquity in me. So let's think briefly about that one. You know, Job has never denied that he sins. So we're not talking about purity as if Job is somebody who's never in his life sinned. Job never said that, and I, I don't think Elihu is suggesting that he ever did. The word that Elihu uses in the Hebrew for pure here is a word that only shows up this one time in all of the Old Testament. So it's not a word that Job ever used or that uh, Moses ever used for that matter, but it's a word that roughly means clean or innocent, uh, free from transgression. That's the idea. And we find that Job has, in fact, suggested that there is no transgression in him that can account for his suffering. He has said, where is my iniquity? He said that to God, which implies a negative answer. So Job has, throughout his suffering, offered up these laments to God in which he has, in fact, protested his innocence. The question of whether he used one exact word or another exact word, it gets to be a little bit, uh, a little bit silly because Elihu, Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz, and Job all knew what they were talking about. And Job was given an opportunity to say, hey, disagree with me. Elihu says at the very end, if you have any words, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. I want to see you put in the right. And Job remains silent. So he gets it. Elihu gets it. Job has argued that in this matter of his suffering, he, Job, is in the right, and God has to answer him. And Job does say, and here we get into pretty much verbatim quotes, Job did say, behold, God finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. Job did say that. Job said that God uh, puts up siege works against him. He builds a road to his tent. He surrounds him with an army. God puts my feet in the stocks. He watches all my paths. That last phrase, watches all my paths, a direct quote where Job said, yes, God watches all my paths. He's like a, like a hawk watching me to step out of line so he can zing me again. That's how Job felt. These are the things that Job in his pain and suffering gave mouth to. He uttered them in the presence of God 
and his friends, and uh, all with an earshot, in fact. So Elihu begins by saying who he is, identifying himself with Job, saying, I'm just like you, another creation of God. And then he says, and Job, I've heard you say these things. That's where he gets to point three. Behold, in verse 12, in this you are not right. Now, that word for right is not a word that means in this you're not simply correct, as if there's a right answer and a wrong answer. It's a word for righteousness. In this you are not righteous. In this you are not holy. In this you are not right in that sanctified godly sense. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. And this is, in a nutshell, the thesis of Elihu. God is greater than man. And I want you to think about that. I know I've shared with some of you who have engaged in theological conversations with me that the very first lesson any theologian must learn is that God is God and you are not. And in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 and 9, God says through his servant, the prophet Isaiah, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways. For my ways and thoughts are higher than yours. There's, the idea being that our thoughts and ideas get to hear, and that's basically where God's begin, and it's only by analogy that we can get the fuzziest, foggiest idea of what God is doing in this world. We see such a small part of what God is doing, just this fraction of the iceberg poking above the water, and we think we understand the whole thing. But beyond our ability to comprehend is 99% of the great and glorious work of God that we have no knowledge of, nor can we. We're finite. God is infinite. We are frail and fall, fallen. He is almighty and utterly holy. And Elihu's thesis is Job... In all of your speeches before God, you can never forget that God is greater than man. Now, the importance of that thought is something that will come out when God himself addresses Job, beginning in Job 38. Because it could be argued, and I will argue it then, when we get to those chapters, that God is in a sense saying, Job, I am greater than you. You don't know what I've been doing. You don't understand creation. You don't understand weather. You don't understand the ways of these wild animals that you live with and you see every day. You have no idea where I was and what I was thinking when I created. God is greater than man. That must be the bedrock foundation of our theology. And it's too easy to drag a holy, almighty God down and remake him in our image when instead we should simply humbly and with a broken joy rejoice that we bear his. Elihu continues his critique of Job by saying, Why do you contend against him? God is greater than us. Why, do you, why will you fight with him? Why, do, why are you throwing challenges up to him? Which is precisely what Job has been doing. And in particular, you've been saying, that God will answer none of man's words. And Elihu says, Job, you're not right. You're not right about that. For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. That even though we, in our spiritual dullness, are insensible to the speech of God, God is speaking. He is revealing himself. And Elihu, in this speech, draws attention to three ways that God is and has been revealing himself. Now, for reasons I'll explain at the end of this sermon, I'm going to summarize these in terms of their, uh, oh, what the Puritan reformers would call their locus, or the area in which these uh, revelations of God takes place. The first is the subconscious, the second is the experience, and the third is the mediator. Now, here's what I mean by that. We could just say, well, the first way is that he reveals himself in a dream or a vision, and we have lots of dreams and visions where God is revealing things to his people throughout the scriptures. We have uh, Jacob in the book of Genesis. We have Joseph famously. We have uh, the baker in the prison in Pharaoh's uh, Egypt. We have uh, throughout the scriptures God revealing himself in this manner. Now, uh, God 
I, I would hesitate to say to you, if you want to know God's will, just take a NyQuil and try to have a dream. That's not at all a good doctrine to derive from this. Because even as we move into the New Testament, we do see God revealing things through a dream or a vision, for example, in Acts 16, as he's leading Paul on his missionary trip to Macedonia. Uh, we have in Acts chapter 20 in Ephesus, an elder in the church there is given a dream in which he sees that Paul, if he goes to Jerusalem, is not coming back, something that in fact took place. Paul went to Jerusalem and didn't come back. But I see no warrant in Scripture for us to rely upon that as a primary or a, uh, even a particularly reliable way to move forward in determining the will of God. Now, offer you a personal anecdote that helps you understand my approach to this idea and then draw a broader conclusion from Scripture. There have been times in my life, two in particular that I can think of, in which I was going to make decisions. I'd made up my mind to do certain things about which the Bible said nothing clear. It was one of those situations where I had two right options, according to Scripture, and I couldn't think of anything in Scripture that would condemn if I did this or anything that would condemn if I did that. And I had decided to do that. And I could not sleep for a week. And when I finally resolved, I'm not going to do that, slept like a baby. Now, what was happening there? When I read in Romans chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, that the conscience sometimes accuses, sometimes defends, that's something that's happening on the subconscious level. Or when I read in John 14 that the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin, that conviction is something that is happening unbidden on the subconscious or supraconscious level. Where in, in a sense, we're being uh, led by something outside of ourselves to have a certain thought or reaction to a certain possibility. And in this passage, Elihu is telling Job, God does speak. And God does reveal and prompt and direct us through some of these experiences we have, even subconsciously, and that come to us unbidden, by which we're given pause for thought and an opportunity to revisit what it is that we might or might not want to do. Now, as a caveat, and I want to be very clear about this, if you think that God has revealed something to you in a dream, and you find no support for it in Scripture, or worse, you find that Scripture does not support it at all, and in fact refutes it, that dream was simply the result of some bad lasagna and lend it zero credence. You see, God has, in these later times, Hebrews chapter 1, given us this revelation through his Son. God has given us a word which guides and directs our paths. God has given us scriptures that, as Paul taught Timothy, are able to make us wise unto salvation. He has given us this God-breathed, codified embodiment of his will, the Bible that is able to equip us and train us for all righteousness. And if I think God has given me some private word that in any way abrogates or infringes upon the prerogative of the word in my life, I am absolutely and certainly wrong. The Bible is the authority in the life of the believer. And we can never forget that. But don't discount that disquietude that God sometimes brings to you when you are pursuing an objective that you may not be sure about. Uh, the second way Elihu says God speaks is through experience. And the experience described here is very traumatic. Verse 19, we read, Man is also rebuked with pain on his bed and with continual strife in his bones, so that his life loathes bread, and his appetite the choicest food. His flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. His soul draws near the pit, and his life to those who bring death. So here's a sense in which uh, Elihu is saying that when we experience great and or terrible things in this life, we may be sure that God is doing that in a way that is intended to teach us something about himself and ourselves, about God and our existence as his creature. And I think Elihu's onto something there, and again, I'll back that up with Scripture. The point is that God is always up to something. 
God, we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, Elihu is not for a second doubting that Job is a child of God, uh, specially favored, loved, and uh, claimed by God as his own covenant son. Elihu says nothing to suggest that that's not what, what he believes to be the case with Job. Job is uh, an Old Testament Christian, to put it in the simplest terms. He is a child of God by grace through faith. Now, Elihu is quite certain that every event in his life and in my life, even sicknesses, are designed as part of this plan, this inworking of providential experiences to lead us closer to God and further along in discipleship. And we see that that's the idea even behind the dreams and the visions or the way that God works upon our subconscious. Look, he says he terrifies us with warnings. He opens our ears while we're in deep sleep or slumber that he, God, may turn man aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. Hide those things that would lead us to be proud or boastful or think that we're all that or we have done such and whatever. <coughs> Not covid Ugh. So, Elihu is absolutely persuaded that God is at work in the life of people, warning them, steering them, directing them, urging them, humbling them, and he does it subconsciously, and he does it through the experiences he has providentially arranged for you to have, in particular, the bad ones. Right, it's easy for us to think that God is showering affirmation and expressing his love for us when great days and gravy trains and... and cherries and ice cream describe our life. But when we're down in those pits and we're on that sick bed and our bones are sticking out, different matter, but there, why you insist, even there, God is speaking. And then he brings up this idea of the mediator, and there's a great caution that has to be spoken here. It's very tempting and very easy to read back into Job chapter 33, everything we know from Romans about the one mediator, or Hebrews about the one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. And in point of fact, it is certainly the case that when we step back from Scripture and we look at it in totality, this is a part of that great tradition of messianic hope that starts as early as Genesis chapter 3. But I don't want to overtax this particular text by importing the totality of a whole New Testament doctrine yet. Instead, I want to just look at it for what it says first. Look, Elihu says to Job, if there be for him, this man who suffers, an angel. Now, that word could be just messenger. A mediator. That's someone like a kinsman redeemer who goes between, who reconciles. One of the thousand, or some translations, one in a thousand. So it could be as if God has thousands. Keep in mind, thousand is the largest word for numbers that the ancient world knew. They had no word for millions. So one of a thousand would be the cultural equivalent of me saying one in a gazillion. That's the biggest word concept they had for a number in that day. So this could be one who is utterly distinct and unique, or one who is a dime a dozen in the courts of the Almighty. And that is a fact that we can take one way or the other. It's not crystal clear which meaning is intended by this particular text. If there be for him an angel, a mediator, one of the thousand or one in a thousand, to declare to man what is right for him. So, three lines in that verse. It's as if the poetry has exploded. All the lines up to this, with one exception, were two lines. This one jumps off the page. This idea that there's a mediator, one in a thousand, to declare to man what is right for him, the same word, which is holy or justifiable in the sight of the living God. If there be someone, God sends a messenger to declare to man what is right. So whether or not this is a dime a dozen variety of mediator or an utterly unique one, the idea is that God sometimes sends people to declare what is right. And if he, God, is merciful to him and says, the mediator, and says, in a sense, to God, deliver him from going down into the pit, I have found a ransom. 
Let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then man prays to God. Then the man who has been interceded for prays to God, and God accepts him. So Elihu is envisioning this. Imagine three parties. There's God, there's a mediator, there's a man. The man is suffering. And the mediator comes along. He's sent by God to come along and tell man this is what is right. And then the mediator says to God, Be merciful to this man. Deliver him from going down to the pit, to the grave, because I have found a ransom. Let him be renewed in his flesh. And the man prays to God, and God accepts him. This is what Elihu envisioned. And no doubt he'd seen this kind of priestly intercession in his own counseling ministry, whatever it may have looked like. He'd seen that happen. He'd seen perhaps Job acting as a messenger from God, declaring wisdom, declaring what is right, and praying on behalf of others. In fact, in Job chapter 42, Job is one such mediator to his other three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, because God says to Job, I am not pleased with them. They have not spoken of me what is right. You offer sacrifice for them, and I will forgive them. <coughs> what happens? Job is the mediator sent from God, and he goes to those friends, and he tells them. And he himself, Job, pays the ransom. He offers the sacrifices, and undoubtedly those friends pray to God, and they are restored. So this is a pattern of spiritual life and the understanding of how to be in right relationship with God that made sense in the ancient world. Now what Elihu couldn't have imagined was how uh, obviously this gives us a foreshadowing of the great mediatorial work of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes on him, whoever accepts his message about what is right, shall not perish, shall not go down to the pit, but shall have everlasting life, shall be restored, the flesh made fresh like youth. And so in an amazing, uh, prescient description of the way God redeems and reconciles himself to man, the way it was done through priests and, and lowercase a, angels or mediators or messengers sent by God to warn and to counsel people to turn from sin and turn to God to accept the ransom, whether that be a lamb on the altar or the very lamb of God on the cross. Elihu was describing something he could not have imagined the depth or the breadth or the height or the glory of because he describes the way God works and speaks. When he sends one of the thousand gospel preachers, missionaries, mis uh, Sunday school teachers, vacation Bible school guides, to share the gospel, to declare what is right, to point people to that great ransom that was paid, and offer them the newness of life, and then that person prays to God, and God accepts them on the basis of the completed work and ministry of Jesus, the great mediator who was himself the ransom. It's interesting to note that the result of this in the life of the one who receives this mediatorial ministry, in Elihu's words, is worship. Then man prays to God and he accepts him. He sees his face with a shout of joy and he sings before men and says, I sinned and perverted what was right and it was not repaid to me. I didn't get what I deserved. Instead, I found grace. He has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit, and my life shall look upon the light. Behold, God does all these things twice, three times with a man, to bring back his soul from the pit, that he might be lighted with the light of life. Elihu's first speech is without a doubt a gospel address. But he premises it on the fact that God is greater than man. And God is always in the business of beaconing out his revelation and revealing to us subconsciously through our experiences and through the voice of others what is right and ultimately proclaiming 
even through the church, this great gospel that results in eternal life for them that believe. It is worth noting that Elihu ends this speech by saying, Pay attention, O Job. Listen to me. Be silent and I will speak. If you have any words, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. I desire to see you established in that right. If not, listen to me. Be silent and I will teach you wisdom. What we're going to see that Elihu shares with Job uh, next week when we look at Job chapter 34 is a message that builds more concretely on the greatness of God. But in this speech of Job, we have seen Job, uh, we have seen Elihu plead with Job and say, Job, God speaks and he is revealing himself. Now you and I, dear Christian and friend, we have the blessed privilege of having the scriptures, which are far and away superior to any mere dream or an experience that we have to decode. In fact, we should use the scriptures to understand everything from our dreams to our illnesses. And more than that, we have the great counselor, the wonderful counselor, the, the spirit of God himself sent a given uh, by God and his Christ to be to us a guide, a comforter, a convictor, uh, a, a leader, a solace, to walk with us. And we have a God who never stops, never stops communicating with us. And to me, that's a great comfort. And I'd like to think that perhaps there are some who are listening to this sermon that need to be reminded that that person, that loved one, maybe that child or that parent or sibling or friend that uh, has turned a deaf ear to God. I just want you to be assured that God does these things two times, even three. That's an Old Testament way of saying he does these things a lot. And just as the heavens declare day by day, night by night, speech regarding the glory of God and the law of the Lord, which the rest of Psalm 19 is about, does the same. And God is not done revealing and offering himself to people. And today is that day of salvation. Today is that day where somewhere in this world, right now, someone is responding to the offer of a ransom and praying to God and being accepted because Christ is a Savior. Somewhere today, somebody's flesh is being freshened like the youth. And they're seeing the light of life. And that someone might be you. That someone might be a friend of yours, someone you've been praying for for decades. Never stop. And I must also, before I end, suggest to you that perhaps you should think about being one of the thousand. You are an ambassador of Christ. You are called to go out and make disciples, not just corporately as a cog in the wheel of your church ministries, but as a living, breathing representative of Christ in your world. Whether you are young like Elihu or have no business speaking because of any other reason, for him it was youth, for you it could be anything. Hasn't God given you a message that just bubbles up in your heart and bursts out? And haven't you been pushing it down and cramping it down and wanting to not talk too much about it because, well, you need job security or, well, you want to be popular? I would just urge you to consider first things first and the eternal things best. And be that mediator. Come alongside others who are stumbling through life like the rest of us. Pray on their behalf and say, oh God, deliver him from the pit. Deliver her from the pit. There is a ransom. Point that person to the ransom and assist them in praying to God that they might find him. What a gospel message. What a wonderful book Job is. May he bless it to us in Christ's name. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness for thinking that you don't answer our prayer frequently enough or clearly enough or often enough. Forgive us for thinking that you're not mindful or compassionate or that you don't reveal enough when you have revealed so much of who you are in your will that all that we need to know is clearly stated in Scripture and backed up in history and demonstrated in our own world. 
Father, give us the confidence and the hope of glory that enables us to live as your people, uh, speaking your message and living your truths. And Lord, I ask you to bless everyone who's heard this message, Lord, and as much as it has been a faithful echo of what you intend to say, Lord, make it stick and sink down into their hearts and minds. Father, if not, may it be quickly forgotten and replace it with the truth that comes from your word in your time through your many, many messengers. And thank you, Almighty God, for the great privilege that we have of being enlisted in that great number. We pray that you bless us. Keep us, guide us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, dear church, uh, be praying for somebody. And even in this COVID time, think about uh, pointing people to that great ransom and helping them to see how God is speaking in their life. And I am really looking forward to seeing you all whenever that is possible. And so until then, I'll just say bye for now.